Glory to God. Glory to God. Welcome to the Hope Bible Institute. This is Kingdom History 101, lesson number one, John Alexander Dowie. John Alexander Dowie, the healing apostle, the healing apostles. Now, the reason why we study kingdom history is very important. In Hebrews chapter six, verse 12, it tells us that we ought to follow after those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So the reason we study history in the natural is so that we can learn from history, that we can learn what we can do better, learn what not to do, learn how to implement certain things and develop in us a character and a fire so that we can go forward with courage. That's why we study history naturally. Now we're going to study history for the spirit in the same reason. We want to know how to advance the kingdom of God and to do it with boldness and courage. And we can't do it if we don't take a close look at the generals that have gone before us to do the work that God has called us to do as well. So we're going to look at John Alexander Dowie. John Alexander Dowie. Let's get an overview of his life, an overview of John Alexander Dowie. He was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. Feel that in your blank. He was born in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Scotland. Now, known as a Scottish healing revivalist, his Scottish roots uh, gave him the, 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 the natural courage that he needed to go forward. The natural, he was filled with fire and courage, as some say, that they, when they speak of John Alexander Dowie. He was a very courageous man. He was a very fiery man. He was born into great poverty and he suffered frequent illnesses. So we see the attack of the enemy on his life being born in poverty caused him to, to, to have those esteem issues around his colleagues or his friends. Not only that, but it caused him to not have a heightened expectation because of the poverty syndrome. Not only that, frequent illnesses attacked him um, so that he wouldn't have confidence in his health. So now God is going to use this man that had frequent illnesses to be the one to promote the gospel concerning healing for the body, just as Jesus has saved the soul. So the second point in that, he was raised in ministry by his parents. And at the age of six years old, he read the entire Bible from front to back. Parents, I can't begin to tell you how important it is for you to raise your kids in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, to lead them down the path. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. It is so vitally important that you understand that you must train your child up so that your child can be a vessel that God will use. So the second thing, he was known as the healing Apostle, fill that in your blank. He was known as the healing apostle. The reason why he was known as the healing apostle, after the Reformation, the church is now rebuilding itself. And right now, at that point, they were in the, um, they were only in the understanding of salvation, justification, faith, and, and even being baptized in the Holy Ghost. But they hadn't begun to scratch the surface and to discuss this major subject called healing or divine healing. John Alexander Dowie was one of the few to reintroduce the subject of divine healing to the body of Christ. He was one of the few that God used. There were others that, uh, uh, such as Mariah Woodworth Etter and F.F. And F. Bosworth and, and, and these people God used in a mighty way to, to push the message. But John Alexander Dowie was one of the very first ones to have the courage now, it takes a lot of courage to stand up and start talking about healing when all the body knows at the time is salvation, justification, faith, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They are actually attacking John Alexander Dowie for that message of divine healing, and he's still pushing it. So at the age of 21, he made a decision to answer the call of God on his life. His ministry was known for having a great balance of the truth and the manifestation of the word of God. He relocated often led by the Holy Spirit to places such as Australia, Scotland, Newton, and even America. He traveled the nation saving the lost and healing the sick. He stood against the darkness of Chicago with his ministry, and he is the founder of Zion City, Illinois. Now, we're going to get a little bit deeper in that in just a second, but I want to point out to you a very, very, very important point. Excuse me. 
a very important point. This important point that we want to look at is that he made a decision to answer the call and he knew the balance of truth in the manifestation of the word of God. He knew this. I don't want to just preach the word. I want to preach a word that you will believe, but a word, then I want to, to be a vessel that God will use to produce manifestations of the word that I preached. We should all desire to manifest the gospel that we're called to preach. We don't want to preach about a healing that we can't produce, and we don't want to preach about a deliverance that we can't produce, and we don't want to preach about a God that we can't prove that is in all authority. No, we want to manifest the gospel, and that's what John wanted to do. So now we're going to take a look at some very important truths about his life. John Alexander Dowie. Number one, he was a man that believed and engaged in spiritual warfare. He believed in spiritual warfare and he engaged in spiritual warfare. It's one thing to know that the enemy is attacking and to know that there are demonic spirits behind the scene and to know that there, there's a spiritual realm that where there's warfare going on. But it's another thing to know it and to and get involved in it, to engage in it. He once said this, we must determine to hold fast to the word of God and fight for what is ours in the earth. Setbacks are always present. But we ought to determine if the problem is to remain permanent. Even though we are called, we still have to war against spiritual evils that are sent to destroy our vision and to discourage us. God's angels can help us. But the warfare with darkness over our destiny is a personal responsibility that we must win. Listen to what he said. God angels can help us, but the warfare with darkness over our call on our life is a personal responsibility that we must win. How do we fight? How do we war? We war with our faith. We war with our prayers. We war with our word. We war with the full armor of God and we fight. We intercede. We, we declare. We pull down. We overthrow. We, we, we do all of those things, but we have to have the courage to do it. We can't sit back and just wait on heaven to just do what it's going to do. Heaven is not going to get involved if you don't get involved. Glory to God. And I get involved with my prayers and my faith, and then heaven gets involved. So the second point that we want to learn from John Alexander Dowie is he refused to be bound by the traditions and religious standards of his day. He refused to be bound by the traditions and the religious standards of his day. First, we found out that we must believe in and engage in spiritual warfare. Secondly, we find out that we will have to refuse to be bound by the traditions and the religion standards of our day. At a time when divine healing was not popular to preach, he made a decision to leave the denomination he was a part of because they forbade him to preach it. He couldn't, he couldn't understand or operate with the cold lethargic state of their leadership. He burned with a passion to proclaim the message of divine healing throughout the city. His congregations had grown over twice the size of the others, but his success spoke to deaf ears. He was constantly fighting the politics in the letter of the law theology that threatened to dampen his faith. In a letter to his wife proclaiming his decision to begin an independent ministry, he wrote with the political system. <coughs> he wrote that the political system of his denominational church, he said, it killed initiative. Speaking of the church, it killed initiative and individual energy. Made men denominational tools or worse, caused them to become worldly minded and left them high and dry and useless. For the most part, they became good ships, but badly steered and terribly overladen with worldliness and apathy. He was never intimidated by persecution. So he wasn't, he wasn't moved by traditions. He never, he, he refused to be bound by traditions. He engaged in spiritual warfare. And the third point that we have to bring out was he was never intimidated by persecution of any kind. It didn't matter what kind of persecution. He stood against the traditions of men. We have to have the attitude to say this, God, if you can prove it in your word, I believe it. I don't care what I have to walk away from to believe it. I will believe it. And you have to believe the word of God. Now, he was never intimidated by persecution of any kind. Dowry was so passionate concerning preaching the word of God that he had no thought for the strong opposition that rose against him. He denounced the evils of the day and formed a group to distribute literature citywide. 
violent persecution, mostly from local pastors. Listen to what I just said. Violent persecution came from local pastors, arose from these pamphlets. Still, Dowie was merciless in with dealing with the liturgic clergy. He didn't miss his words, responding that he did not recognize their right to request any information of any information of his action, nor did he have any respects for their judgment. He answered one minister with these words. I consider your judgment to be as feeble and incapable as your ministry. Ooh, glory to God. I consider your judgment to be as feeble and incapable as your ministry. That's a powerful quote there that he stood against uh, the persecution that came his way. He didn't run from it. Sometimes we have to understand that, well, not sometimes, all of the time we must understand that all that live godly must be persecuted. They will be persecuted. So he embraced the person. Sometimes we have to embrace the persecution. He embraced it. He knew he was different. He knew he was on assignment and he did what God called him to do, regardless of who didn't like it. So the next thing that we learn from John Alexander Dowie is something we learn not to do. We've learned that we must engage in spiritual warfare. We learned that we should not be bound by the traditions and the religious standards of our day. We learned that we are, not we are not to be intimidated by persecution of any kind. But one mistake he made was at moments he questioned the call of God on his life. And I need you to make sure you fill in that blank. He questioned the call of God on his life. That was one of the mistakes he made. He was moved to run for political office, but what moved him to do so is the question. He thought he could make he thought he could make more of an impact being a politician than he could being a preacher. His desire to run for political office greatly wounded his ministry. He was moved by such spiritual yearnings that he sought to fulfill them in the natural. One could only speculate why he, why he made this move. He could have been because the church world wasn't grasping the truth fast enough to satisfy him. Whatever his reason was, he misread the timing and the plan of God for his ministry. And that's what I meant by uh, questioning the call of God on his life. He misread the call of God on his life. He misread the timing. He misread it. And that's how he questioned it. God would call him to do one thing and then there he was questioning that God called me to do this and jumping into another thing. He misread the timing. Time is, is very important. You have to learn to stay in the lane that God has called you in, that God has placed you in and walk in that assignment. Don't be moved by too many different things trying to fulfill your spiritual assignment with natural efforts. That's the mistake that John Alexander Dowie did. He always fell in love with politics because he wanted to change the world around him when he was actually changing the world around him by impacting it spiritually. So the next thing in that point was we read and understand that God has a central point for which every aspect of our lives ought to operate, whether individually or corporately, that area is called timing. From the operation of that one word, lives can move forward for God or be hindered. Nations can advance spiritually or regress. Life in the spiritual realm has a timing to it, just as life in the natural. Therefore, it is vitally important for us to follow the leading of our spirit, of our spirit as the Holy Ghost leads us. We must learn that it is not always right to move into action because it seems like the right thing to do. This kind of obedience only comes from seasons of prayer and intercession. Uh, one of uh, our, our graduate students who's a pastor, Dr. Brian Banks, he made the statement like this. Don't get the good thing, God thing confused with the good thing. One of them have too many O's. Uh-oh. They have too many O's. So you can get the God thing confused with the good thing. And just because it's a good thing doesn't mean it's a God thing. You want to make sure you're doing what God is calling you to do. And this type of sensitivity and responsiveness to the spirit only comes from seasons of prayer and intercession. Another mistake we made, uh, the, he made, the, uh, John Alexander Dowie, he made, was he did not discern divine relationships. That was a mistake he made. He did not discern divine relationships. He met a powerful evangelist by the name of Mariah Woodworth Etter. She was a seasoned, powerful, wise, healing evangelist, and conflict arose between them. Dowie began to ridicule her as a female minister and denounce her method of ministry. 
This was a tragic mistake on his part. In our lives, we have many relationships, some casual, sometimes they're intimate. But the most significant ones to the kingdom of God are the divine relationships. In every call, whether secular or ministerial, God sends divine relationships to help strengthen your walk with him. We may have many casual relationships, but divine relationships are very few. They can usually be counted on one hand. Don't miss your divine relationships in life. There will always be fellow laborers, but divine relationships are few and far between. Glory to God. So I want to close out with this statement about John Alexander Dowell. What did we learn from him? Number one, we learned that we ought to engage in spiritual warfare. We also learned that we ought to not be bound by the traditions and the religious standards of our day. Here's the third thing we learned. We learned to never be intimidated by persecution of any kind. But we also learned that we cannot question or misread the call of God on our lives. We have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then we learned that we have to discern the divine relationships in our life and not allow the enemy to divide it. So as we close out, I want to make these statements about John Alexander Dow. He moved around preaching the gospel, traveling all of these places as we spoke of. Then he finally reached a place called Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. Now, at that time, you got to understand that Chicago is the capital of all ungodliness in the U.S. at that time. They're there. There's so much going on there. There's drugs. There's prostitution. There's alcohol. There, 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 there's, 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 there's mobsters. There's, there's violence. There's death. There's everything right there in Chicago as John Alexander Dowry is pinching his tent there. And then as the world uh, circus would come to Chicago, John Alexander Dowry would set up a tent outside of the circus. And he would set up a tent and on the tent it would say prayer and deliverance. And that's before you come in, people will walk in the snow to go to the circus. But then they would stop at John's tent and allow him to pray and their lives would be given to Christ. And they turn around and not want to go into the circus. They don't want anything to do with what the circus had going on. They would give their lives to Christ. He was that bold. He structured Zion, Zion, Illinois. Now, when we understand Zion City or Zion, Illinois, we understand that this is a city. OK, great. It is a city. But you have to understand this. It wasn't a city before John Alexander Dowie. He brought a piece of land and had a vision to start a city. Now, most times we want to go, we want to take over a city or we want to want to enhance that city for God. Well, glory to God. He not only wanted to take over a city, he wanted to start one. And in this city, they would have certain things. Now, it was a bit more strict than it should have, a little bit more legalistic than it should have. But his intentions were pure to have a place where believers could call home and they can honor God. So in this place, you got to understand, in this place he called home in Illinois, he was arrested one time, a hundred times in one year. He was arrested 100 times in one year for preaching the gospel and healing the city. And they arrested him for charges like practicing medicine with no license because he would lay hands on the sick and they would recover and they would charge him for that. He was a mighty, mighty man of God. And then as he began to grow, he began to get more into politics of, of, of the city and wanting to run the, uh, the Zion, Illinois. Then he should have been more focused in the ministry aspect and allow administrators to handle that. But however, he wanted to handle all of it himself. And his pride began to set in, being in charge of all of these different things that God has placed on his care. Pride is a deadly thing. It's a dangerous thing. Pride came in and is setting his heart up on high. And next thing you know, he began to declare himself a foolish gesture. He began to say that he was Elijah, the second coming of Elijah. That's a very foolish thing because Elijah was a prophet that represented the old covenant. John represented, John Alexander Dowie represented a new covenant for him to go and set himself back. And that's what the enemy does. He deceives you. And the things that he used to deceive you don't make sense. And he desired to be Elijah, the second coming. He had this arena that was set up that would have hundreds and thousands of crutches and canes and walkers and, and wheelchairs and all of these things that were set up back then. 
He would have them on the wall and lined against the wall to let them know that Jesus is Lord against any sickness. And then his pride set in and he started calling himself Elijah and he took pictures in robes and said he was Elijah. And before you know it, he wanted to set out to rent out the Madison Square Garden and to have a conference there. And when he did it, it didn't work because of his reputation was starting to be tarnished by his pride. It didn't work at all. So how did this end? Well, it was a sad ending. This man that healed all of these people of all of these diseases and all of these things that God used as a mighty vessel, he ended up dying. Sad ending of pain, sickness, and isolation. One person, uh, John Lake said that when he went and saw him for the last time that he had to lay on his back on the floor just to look him in his face because he was bent over and couldn't raise up. The pride broke him down. It destroyed his ministry. His desire to set himself up higher than what God was doing. It destroyed his ministry. That's what we learned from John Alexander Dowie. Does it mean that his ministry was a failure? No, it was not. It was an awesome ministry that did awesome things that paved the way for us. In fact, some of his spiritual lineage include John Graham Lake, John G. Lake, F.F. F. Bosworth, Bob Bosworth, Gordon Lindsay, A.A. A. Allen, Jack Cole, and many more. He was a powerful man of God with a successful ministry that ended in a very sad and tragic way. We must learn from John Alexander Dowling. Follow the spirit. Discern divine relationships. Don't set yourself up in pride. Engage in spiritual warfare. Refuse to be bound by traditions. Never be intimidated by persecution. And if we do these things, we will find that God will use us in a mighty way and we have a successful ministry as well. I want to thank you for this opportunity. This was a blessing to me. God bless. Amen.